Hi, all. These are generally conversations between adults after the children have left the table. The language can be spicy, and the subjects can get saucy. So, if you're ready, this is the Southern Fork. Unscripted chats with some of the most interesting culinary voices in the American South. This region is one of the country's vacation and retirement playgrounds. But beyond the warm weather and beautiful scenery, there's a rich culture steeped in community and often dark and complicated history and plenty of innovation among the tradition. I'm Stephanie Burt, and I've spent a career covering this region for magazines, newspapers, and websites. And to me, the best introduction to the American South is through its food culture and the growers and makers who make it delicious. I invite you to come on the road with me from the Appalachian Mountains to the clear waters of the Gulf of Mexico and everywhere in between. I'm always hungry for that next bite, thirsty for the next sip, and ready for the next conversation. Let's dig in. Before we get started today, I just wanted to pop in here. I wanted to let you know about something that I'm very, very excited about when it comes to the Southern Fork, and that is a new experience division of the Southern Fork. This is going to be travel itineraries. Um, There's a lot happening behind the scenes, and it's happening very fast. I'm so excited. So there's already things that have happened in the past week since I mentioned it on Nico's podcast. So the best way to keep up with this is one, I really think you should subscribe to the newsletter and you can go to the southernfork.com and there is a great way, a little form to sign up. That'll give you information. I write a monthly newsletter telling you kind of where you know, episode updates, where my bylines are being published and anything definitely that is coming on the experience front. But we're going to have some pop ups coming down the pike. And I'm going to be traveling to different cities and hopefully seeing some of you. So please go to the southernfork.com experience. The first is the Southern Fork experience Charleston. So if you have any plans, any glimmers on the edge of your brain that you might want to visit Charleston, please come and join me. This is a very exclusive itinerary and everybody that I am working with, all the culinary storytellers have been part of a Southern Fork podcast. And so this really is my culinary home base brought to life. And It is going to be like no other excursion, no other tour that you could get for Charleston. So please keep that in mind. That's coming the first week in October of this year. So please click on the southernfork.com slash experience to learn more. Now, on with the show. According to Severa Magazine, Border food is defined as Mexican food with a distinct identity, influenced by the cooking of Chihuahua and Texas, but with a number of little twists. Because Texas is so large and diverse, it's a more nuanced label than the overarching Tex-Mex, and one surprising spot that is celebrating it with abandon is in Greenville, South Carolina. Dana Lee is the chef and operator of Comal 864, a petite spot with a big heart and a smoking hot flat top. With her clear vision of the food of her childhood and a combination of grit and introspection on her own life path, she's gained some well-deserved attention. From being named one of Eater's 18 Essential Greenville Restaurants, to a nomination as a 2023 James Beard semifinalist. 
Originally from South Texas and specializing in Mexican-American cuisine, she began her work in a series of brewery pop-ups, teaching herself to channel homesickness into cooking and making more room for others at the table along the way. Last summer, I had the chance to eat my fill of tacos at Kamal on a hot June night, and I've been wanting to sit down with her ever since. So we finally got the chance to record at this year's Charleston Wine and Food Festival. The only thing missing? More tacos. Welcome to the Southern Fork, Dana. Thank you for having me. I am thrilled to have <laughs> have the chance to sit down with you. We tried to make this work and it didn't work and now it all of a sudden works. Absolutely. Um, I'm always thrilled to have the opportunity to sit and um, Charming Inns has been such a great partner to Charleston Wine and Food and they've been such a great partner to the Southern Fork too. I've recorded here for a few years episodes during Charleston Wine and Food and so I'm excited to be all tucked cool. in on this rainy day. Yeah. Um, the only thing really is missing, which could have happened if somebody just cared more about me would have been hot tortillas hot tortillas that's fair <laughs> yeah my uh hotel kitchen is quite limited i imagine <laughs> so i mean i had such a great meal with you last summer in greenville south carolina and i just ran out of time to interview everybody there's a lot of good food happening in greenville it really is yeah it's, the food scene in greenville is incredible you have to know where to look and um there's a lot of talent and there's a lot of people who are doing things a little bit differently. And mm -hmm. I, I'm i here for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to talk about a lot of things that you do that are different. Well, number one, you're another one of my pop-up stars that got your brick and mortar. And as I have mentioned in other podcasts for writers like me, pop-ups are a great place. Um, it's really exciting. It's kind of the next generation of food trucks, right? Yep. Without being inside of a burning tin can exactly. when it's 90 degrees. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like pop-ups, I think, offer the opportunity for people to just be experimental, see what works and what doesn't without such heavy overhead. But the power of a pop-up, I mean, that's still your brand. And for me personally, starting things the way that I did, it's always been like slowly but surely type of thing. And um, I'm really thankful that I had those folding tables and the Walmart electric griddle yeah running around the people would let me set up you know that's true because you're also creating you're testing your recipes mm -hmm. you're um creating community yes you're creating your own buzz you're testing you know what you want to do but you're also creating a community for you as a Absolutely. chef so you're finding who is wanting to work with you mm -hmm. who is ready to support you mm -hmm. and that's one thing i really love about the culinary community is there's so much support not always in every market but in a lot of markets for it, yeah. people it's yeah. it's just really powerful i'm really thankful that it's become a cool thing to do. I think it's also like a good testament of somebody's ability, ability to persevere, you know, because I remember the days, like I said, with folding tables, lugging them around, lugging ice chests and, you know, $20 Walmart griddles. Yeah. <laughs> and like to go from that to now I walk into my kitchen and it's like, I have a kitchen now. I'm aiming to have more kitchens. And so like to know that those things have changed, but what hasn't changed is my attitude towards the opportunity to wake up every day and get to do this how did you know that food was the medium for you to express creatively i had to move so i'm from south texas born and raised and, <laughs> and I'm, sometimes i'm delusional <laughs> like i live in a pretty consistent state of delusion to be quite honest with you <laughs> um but we moved um up to greenville uh, about eight years ago and I realized then when I moved that not everybody eats the same way that I grew up eating. And I was like, what do you mean not everybody has tacos for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Like, it was just a very big culture shock for me. And so it was when I decided to use food as a tool to cling on to where I, like, cling on to the heritage of where I come from. Mm -hmm. um, and I just missed homemade meals that I grew up eating that my grandmother and my mom would make for me. And so that's when I was like, I don't know how else to properly express my homesickness. I, I want to do something with this energy. It felt very tangible, like in my hands, like excess energy. Right. And I was like, okay, let's start to cook. And let me tell you, I was 
horrid at it in the beginning. Like, <laughs> fuck. It was pretty bad. But, you know, the more that you practice, obviously, practice makes better. <laughs> and it was and just... And you had that family you could call and mm-hmm, be like, yeah. hey, wait, what's going on and it, here? And honestly, less of that, but more so, like, what I grew up being taught to cook was the holiday and family-style Mexican meals. So, like, tortillas, um, menudo, tamales, all of the stuff that we would eat during the holiday season, that's my specialty. But when you're talking about just being in the kitchen, I really didn't spend that much time in the kitchen growing up. My mom didn't really have me around cooking. Like it, it came out of what felt like necessity. You know, mm-hmm. it was like I had nothing else to cling on to. I missed home. I didn't want my son to not have access or not have some of the meals that I grew up eating. I didn't want to like get rid of that part of me. Quickly, f- me and food became best friends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, that idea of tangible energy in your hand. You work hard. Yeah. You are working hard. You're on that line. And I love, I love that we can sit right at the counter with you. But is it now that you have this thing that has to be maintained, mm-hmm. right? How is it? I mean, like, I do love you like it. it? I like it. I do like it. I like a challenge. I like being told that I can't do something and it's not going to last and then just shitting on you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I thrive. And this is something I've said recently. Like currently I'm in a space where I think I'm thriving off of others negativity. Like I'm like the resentment, the anger, the everything. I'm not like, I'm a good person. I'm a kind person, but I'm not a nice person. I'm irritated easily. I'm always pissed. Like it, you know, it's just, it comes with, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, And I've been thriving recently and like, doing the things that scare me simply because somebody tells me, says I can't, or I see a comment somewhere that's, they're like, oh, it's not even that, whatever, whatever negative thing it is. I'm like, do it again, do it again, do it again. <laughs> it's probably some unhinged behavior that needs to be discussed <laughs> at some point. Well, but. I think a lot of us really, we do really respond to tell me I can't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it depends on who is doing the telling, right? Yeah. And whether you trust that judgment, mm-hmm. you know, because sometimes you might be like, Really? You don't think I can? What is yeah. what is missing? You know, like if you trust that person, of course, um, you might be. What blind spot do I not mm-hmm. see? There has been an upswell of support beyond that comment for what you do. Oh yeah, and it has also included a James Beard nomination. It has. So, so. and I'm not done. Like <laughs> I'm just not done. I am. Um, I'm wake up every day, and my first thought aside from my family, of course, is, wow, I get to do this. This is a blessing. It's crazy, I guess, because I'm in my own head, that to see other people love on me the way that they do, I don't understand it all the time. Right. But I recognize that instead of trying to figure out the why, I'm wasting time by doing that, so get my ass back to work. Like, I love being loved. I love loving. I'm a very intense person. Mm-hmm. Like just emotions I, abound. I, I don't think you need to explain <laughs> that. I, I feel like I've gotten that. Yeah. It is I, you know, and that's just what I got. But I'm, I'm also intense. Okay. But okay. So so we're there's a lot of energy in this room yes. right now at the fault lane in. So <laughs> I'm just so grateful that people like that they fuck with me, that they love me, that they they're like they keep up with what I'm doing. They care about my opinions. They care about you know, how I feel about something like that's an honor and that's yeah. also a responsibility. Yes. And I recognize that. Well, let's talk a little bit about that responsibility. Let's dig into the food a bit before we get into the neighborhood thing. <laughs> okay. Cause we're going to talk about that. Okay. You know that I really think of you as an ambassador, you know, of a particular kind of South Texas cuisine for Greenville. And so there's got to be a lot of education. There's mm-hmm. got to be a lot of that. But there's something that's less intimidating about the setup there. You're just coming in. People think they know tacos, right? And they do. Mm-hmm. They just don't know your tacos, tacos. And they don't know that. So let's talk a little bit about what kind of experience people have coming in. Yeah. Um, so the experience is very casual. I have I can't pretend to be pretentious for it. Like, I'm not uppity like that. Like, I'm a very casual person. And I think that that reflects in our concept and in my food. It's casual. It's delicious. It's filling. It's affordable. It's good energy. You walk in, you know, you're going to be top two immediately. And that just, it reflects. We do small batch cooking, so nothing's made in large batches. Constantly cooking, 
constantly making batches throughout the day, fresh batches throughout the day. Everything's made to order. And, um, you know, I think that that's a, like a very clear reflection in the cooking. I might be out of something that's because I only bought X amount to make X amount. Right. And that's it. Right. Like, I can't just pop something into a microwave. We don't have a microwave in the building. You know, I don't know what to tell you. Like, good things don't just happen. They Magically. don't just pop up like that, you know? Yeah, they but don't. with the open air, con- like the open concept, you can see what we're doing. Right. And I think that that is an important part of the, like, the connection that people make with me plus my food, and then they eat it. I was excited to have you on the show, and I have to uh, tell a little a little story. I have I thought of you. I was, just, I was in Mexico City in February, and it was my first time, and it was really, really cool. cool. And we're at this market, and the center of the market is all these food stalls, but they're not like, here's a table and hand it. It was very much like, come on. It was. It was like... Being in your restaurant, you know, with I could see the griddles behind, Mm -hmm. you know, and you could see everything working and people cutting the avocado right there and you're just getting quesadillas. And it just really reminded me of that space. And I think Americans, we either consider food fast Mm -hmm. or we consider food fine. Mm -hmm. And we have a hard time with that fast, casual, middle, middle, whatever you want to call it, because there is a lot of microwaves in that world. I mean, that area is expanding in Mm -hmm. American food um, because it's one of the only places to make money as well. Right now, it's hard. But fast, steady does not mean fast microwaved. Yeah. It doesn't have to meet that. Like, it doesn't have to mean that at all. It's not just the food. It's an entire experience. And I feel like when you say that, experience is typically geared towards finer dining. Mm -hmm. You can have an experience in a place where you don't feel out of place. That is such a subtle point, but so powerful. Right. Let's let's say that again, Um, that, you know, you only think of experience. That's what I was trying to say with the fast casual. You only think of experience with fine dining or you just think of I need to get some food. Mm -hmm. But you can have an experience. Yeah, you can have both. Like, okay, (sighs) experience, yes. So the energy, it just so happens that the restaurant has an open air. That's how it was. That's what I could afford to get into, you know? Mm -hmm. So we took that and we ran with it now. But I think that it's become a big part of us is to be able to see us doing everything, to be able to hear us talking in the kitchen about making another batch, hear us like there's a connection Mm -hmm. that we have. You know, the food itself is delicious because we make good Mexican food. We make good border food. It's simple food. Food doesn't need to be complicated with 150 different layers to it for it to be good. I'm not aiming, again, I'm not aiming for a fine dining experience. I'm aiming to feed you, to provide you sustenance, to make sure that when you walk out, you're good to go and you can tackle whatever the hell is going on outside of those doors. Because I recognize that people are coming in to spend their hard-earned money with me. I need, want to give you a good experience. I want to make sure when you experience the world back outside and you get back to your car, I did my part. Do with that what you will. Do your part. Yeah. And then leave it. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Well, it's a great segue <laughs> into doing your part in the neighborhood. And it's been the place where a lot of press is happening for you. I know you, you roll your eyes a little bit because you're like, yeah, this is just normal for me, but... It's a little different for restaurateurs. So I think I read something like one in four people in the neighborhood are on SNAP benefits mm-hmm. um, in in your neighborhood in Greenville. That has really shifted how you have a responsibility. Absolutely. In the community. So you have a free Thanksgiving meal. Mm-hmm. Um, what else is going so on in that vein? We've started, we've been open two and a half Two and a half, two and a half years. Yeah. And, um, we did our first Thanksgiving community meal the week after we opened. So like we'd been open a week, but all that time that was between me signing the lease, being in the building, getting it cleaned up, you know, getting it situated. I started to see the same people over and over and over again. Right. I see them with an obvious need. I don't know. I've just always been the type of person. And it's like, well, if you have nothing and I have two, you can like, have one. We can have one. Yeah. And we like, I don't know. I just, that's just how my brain moves. Mm -hmm. I fundamentally believe that food is not a privilege. Like food is a right. It should be a basic right. So to see people going without, to see kids clearly hungry, nothing happens on accident. Like I was placed here by something 
some energy somewhere, whatever it is, I need to do something. I cannot turn a blind eye to it. These people allow me to set up my business in their neighborhood. I'm making a few pennies, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, off of being here. How can I leverage my platform, my following, my group of friends I know all want to help but don't know where to go? Right. Let's let's get together. Mm-hmm. Let's cook some food up. We have this kitchen now. Let's go. And so this past Thanksgiving, we did 800 plates. We've done it three years in a row. Christmas, we do the same thing. So my Thanksgiving day and my Christmas day, we get up ass crack of dawn. My nine-year-old, my husband, we get a bunch of volunteers. We have heaps and heaps of donations that come in because I'm taking donations year round. You got something extra in your closet that you're not going to use anymore. Bring it to me. I know that there's people I know that will come and need it. And so we get up and we made like 60, I don't know, like 40 or 60 turkeys for Thanksgiving. We did like 15 for Christmas. People bring in size and people are always like, oh, you, you, you. Like, I'm so thankful that people think highly of me, but we all need to take a step back and recognize that this is us. Like, all I did is flap my fucking gums. Like, (laughs) I just (laughs) opened my mouth. I say, hey, we want to be helpful. Hey, we post about food insecurity. Hey, we post about all these things. Let's do something. Mm -hmm. Because the idea is not to change the world. Like, I'm not in the business of doing that. And I have no fucking desire. What I want to do is I want to be a good neighbor. And as far as my arms can stretch, can I provide you with something basic? Can I help you? How can I be a good neighbor? It's just logical. Like, if I have, the, if I can do it, I'm going to do it. And, you know, like I said, going back to my, like my friends and my groups of people that I know, everybody's always, oh, we want to help. We go volunteer here. We go do that. Or they donate, you know, money. But you have to go, you have to deal with organizations that have boards and people have to get paid. Like, how much of that money is actually going mm-hmm. to help? Well, I think it's all of it. The answer is all above, right? Mm-hmm. Is that it's a yes and world, not mm-hmm. either or, or world. Yep. And I think this summer you had a little, you had some tables out front with Mm -hmm. planters in them Mm -hmm. and people, I'm sure you're picking from them if you Mm -hmm. need them, but other people can just pick from them as they go. So just little things like that um, really, really shift a lot. Super cool. Just (laughs) super cool. But I want to know when you get in at that ass crack of dawn and you need to be cooking. What is it that you're cooking for each other as mm. you're you're about to stand over the trash can and eat it really fast mm-hmm. so you're not messing up a plate that you're going to have to clean later? Mm-hmm. That's the chef way. Absolutely. <laughs> over the trash can is my favorite so, place to be. So talk to me about some of those food that you miss in a visceral way and now that you can cook for you two on your flat top. Mm-hmm. So our go-to always is be tacos. He's a chicken guy. So anything chicken, like he just wants the chicken tacos. So it's very easy to cook for him. He's very uh, easy to please, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is, works out for me perfectly. I'm always going to eat al pastor. Al pastor is something like I'm going to put it in a taco and I'm literally just going to heat the, ta- the tortilla up really, really fast, drop in some meat. I put it into like a ball almost and it, like it just goes in my mouth. And then I'm like, okay, six bites. <laughs> go back so like, that's what we're doing but as far as dishes that i think that make me feel it takes me back or a little nost- nostalgia i guess fideo uh fideito so it's like little vermicelli noodles and like growing up like it's like a soup with noodles it's so simple it's poor it's like one package you know feeds four mm-hmm. and you add you know whatever you can but it's definitely like we're at the end of the paycheck type of thing that's like when when i make fideo he will eat the entire package and act like he just had the <laughs> finest of <laughs> finest the dishes and i'm like you're so fucking irritating for doing that stop it <laughs> um but yeah the, it's the, the simplest food is definitely what makes like uh yeah i just get that feeling Would i don't you? know i don't think there's like a word for that i haven't been able to put a word to it but i get that feeling of like just like peace, I guess. Mm-hmm. And it's just like very simple and I feel safe. And uh. Well, I said something the other day that I'm going to be repeating a lot, but um, we I was having a lot of conversations about this recently and it's really stuck with me. If we think food is medicine, medicine is not only physical, it's metaphysical. And there's something about food mm-hmm. that is a deep satisfaction mm-hmm. where you can be sustained yeah. beyond just your body yeah absolutely. and maybe that's that feeling it's just like nourishing nourishing and yes. like i don't know like uh, you know the world is on fire everybody's horrible whatever whatever but like food 
Mm. <laughs> you can like, you know, just it feels nice. It's just, uh, You're like, you know, soup. Yeah. Soup is <laughs> just good. soup. I'm real happy about that. Yeah, it's the most basic of things that just feel like all is right in the world for those 30 seconds while I'm chewing it. Yes, you know? yes. And then I'll go back and keep fighting fires and keep dealing with people, but let me have my feel ill. Yes. Like, <laughs> Well, you've come a long way in two and a half years in a brick and mortar and before that, you know, working hard to get to that point. Yeah. So what is making you hungry? What are you thinking about now? I'm always hungry for muddy schools. I want to really dive into muddy schools or, or raw seafood, like Mexican yeah. prepared. I'm obsessed. Inspired. <laughs> yes. Okay. So like I'm a ceviche, a guachile yeah. girl. You know, I like my pulpo. I like my, all of that. So that is something that I've been trying to dabble with a little bit more. That'll be my dish for, this my dish for the weekend. Um, I'm going to do a strawberry basil ceviche. Just kind of change up how people, how we, how I'm approaching this specific ceviche. Um, but mariscos in general always make me super excited. They're so versatile. And I think that being in the South, it's hot, you know, it's a really nice summer, like it's refreshing. It, it's just great that and then asian food also has me in a chokehold right now i'm mm. just i got the, got a walk and like we're just walking it out at home <laughs> we're gonna see how i can get that infused with what i do already i think it'd be really fun to do like an asian mexican dish mm -hmm. and then also what's really has me excited right now is storytelling dinners i'm doing a storytelling dinner and i think that again food is a component but when you learn about where food comes from and the history behind it. Absolutely. Um, That's um, AKA much... the Southern Fork. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so Good. I'm doing a dinner with a, a historic content creator. He's really big on TikTok. We j both just did a TED Talk. Um, we did that last week. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. And so um, he's a storyteller. And so we're going to talk about La, uh, Los Mascogos de Coahuila. And it's a group of people that were indentured slaves in Florida. And they escaped to Mexico. And now they're like based, they mm -hmm. stay there. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Tejano culture and how the border shifted, how Texas used to be Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do a five course dinner that kind of represents what they were eating, how they were eating, obviously a little bit more of an elevated, you know, with a twist. But I think that stories and food belong together. And I want to see more of that. And I want to be part of that. I, that's what's got me really interested right now is make me feel something aside from just the food that's mm -hmm. got me hungry. Great. What is one aspect of being a chef that meshes like a natural puzzle piece fit with your natural personality? Depression. Just kidding. I'm <laughs> playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. I'm playing, I'm playing. That was really mean. I'm sorry. No, um, no. I, it, was, <laughs> it was kind of brilliant. <laughs> no, it's, um, I think I'm in my head and I think that most chefs are like that. I'm very intense. I do believe that, uh, full disclaimer, I will be one of the kindest chefs anybody will ever work for. I don't believe in screaming at people. Like, we're not going to be embarrassing. We're not going to do that. No. But I do get really mad. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I just have a very wide range of emotions. Yes. Well, yes. My team, I don't even know how they do it. Like, <laughs> shout out to you guys because. <laughs> <laughs> well. Then I have to say, and that's me sounding like Andy Griffith there for a second. Well, <laughs> um, have to ask you just one, one thing keeping you up at night. How I'm going to have longevity in my brand. How am I going to continue to mold something that outlasts me? I am so hell bent on impacting people to maybe be a little bit kinder. And I worry about that like when i'm gone mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. how what can i do while i'm here to make my brand which is me be positive mm -hmm. leave something positive legacy yeah like i've got a son you know so it's like hopefully he'll bury me <laughs> mm -hmm. and when he does i want him to know my what my heart was mm -hmm. and i hope that a little piece of mm, ill <laughs> I just hope that okay. a little piece of that. <laughs> just, know, more emotions, yeah, just more just emotions. Yeah, just more emotions. But I just hope that a little piece of that lives with him and he puts that out there too. All right. I'm going to reel you in on this last one because I only have so much room in my magic picnic <laughs> basket. But um, I am so honored to finally get you on the Southern Fork podcast and share your wonderful, like, effusive and passion about what you do with others so i just want everybody to come and eat but <laughs> please do and um 
I have this magic picnic basket, and this is really a dream meal scenario. Instead of asking you about a death row meal, since I don't believe in the death penalty, Mm -hmm. I want to bring you some foods that bring you life. And with this magic picnic basket, I can time travel. I can go back in time and ask anybody to make one more bite. I can source for you and I can cook a little bit as well. So I would love to put some favorite things. I know that shifts and changes depending on the seasons, depending on the mood, Mm -hmm. what you're into, and just bring you some things. They don't have to go together in a composed Mm -hmm. meal. Chefs love to try to make a menu out of this. Don't. Just let me put some stuff in here. You can eat it on the floor of your hotel room. Okay. What? can I put in that basket for you? I want homemade beef jerky. I want a tequila bottle. What kind of tequila? Reposado. And I also want a mezcal bottle. I want fruits. I want mangoes, lots of mangoes, and I need avocados. I want dried chilies also, and I want dark chocolate, and I want red beef, like I want beef, and I want gulf shrimp also. Okay. And Taco? I'll be good with that. Some tacos to corn. Put it all I can in? make my own. Just <laughs> you bring me corn. corn. Yeah, yeah. Just bring the corn. <laughs> that sounds like a wonderful, wonderful picnic. And I'm a reposado person, so I'd love to have have a drink <laughs> with you. So. If you want to learn more about Dana and her wonderful restaurant in Greenville, South Carolina, you can go to the southernfork.com. You know I will have images there so you can see the face behind the voice. If you like what you hear, there are more than 350 episodes in the archive. So I would love for you to pop in and get to know some of the other people who make this region of the country so special. But most importantly, this year, I'm asking if you like this episode, please share it with a friend. You probably know somebody that has vacationed in Greenville or lives in Greenville or maybe is looking at a retirement condo in Greenville. Share this episode with them if that's the case. And meanwhile, Dana and I are going to go have some tacos and tequila. tequila. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Thanks so much. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Talking With My Mouthful. One of the things that I always look for these days in a southern city is what I like to call a mill district, especially textile mills. I've mentioned this before, I'm sure, on the show that textile mills um, are the were these huge, really game changers for the southern cultural landscape at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. And they really, really changed the face of cities as well. And as a lot of operations ceased or moved overseas, then you had these big, empty blocks of um, buildings, you know, these huge brick warehouses and a lot of mill homes around them that were built very sturdy, but they were small, they were modest. And they, you know, these areas would just really, really go into depression. And one of the major areas really for textile mills in the South was Greenville, South Carolina. And so When I think back about visiting Dana at Kamal 864, um, her neighborhood in West Greenville is really surrounded a lot by these big mill warehouses and modest homes. And this is a very exciting thing for historic preservationists and especially for historic preservationists that are willing to work with redevelopers. So a lot of these mill areas are being redeveloped into really cool mixed use sites. And a lot of people like like me would love to have a mill house and, you know, necessarily flip it, but take good care of it and love it for its really well-constructed bones and modest size. I I love a cottage. Um, so I'm sure you're starting to think about summer travel. Really start doing your research on southern cities, if you're staying in the U.S., southern cities that have mill village districts or um, mixed-use developments. It's a great way to to find some um, really 
I don't know, some young, fresh energy when I'm doing research. It's just really neat. And Greenville has a lot of these. um, And they've been made into food halls and apartments and luxury condos and all kinds of different things because Greenville was just a convenient gateway from the Appalachian Mountains. And it had a lot of natural water and these mills needed that. So that's a history lesson kind of around the edges. It's a great way to keep the character of the city while at the same time attracting, you know, a new vibrant energy into that, that old unused space. Thanks so much for listening today, and I look forward to chatting with you next time. You've been listening to The Southern Fork. I can't wait to bring you more culinary conversations, but in the meantime, I have one question. Are you going to eat all that?